with your warm up that you had yesterday and kind of generalize or talk about the chi squared goodness of fit. So, the last two days we've been working on your chi squared, ooh, chi squared goodness of fit problems. Okay? So, the chi squared goodness of fit. The key with the chi squared goodness of fit problems is that there is only one variable. Okay, in this problem here that you had last night, the only variable was the type of candy that you had. And then there were four different types of candy that you had. So basically we had one column of observed data. Okay, and then we would put the second column, we would put the expected. So we only had one column of observed data. All right. So here's how that differs from what we are learning today. Today is basically a series of two or more groups. So it's multiple two proportion tests. So you will have your observed is going to be more than just one column of data. It's going to actually have two sets of data. So we have multiple two proportion tests going on at the same time. In this case, I have, let's see, six two proportion tests that I would be running. Okay? So you have more than just one set of observed. You have more than one variable. And I'm a, I apologize, there, this, these notes that I, I would like to redo them, there's a lot, a lot of data just kind of listed here. Much of it we already know. So I'm going to highlight things that are different and that are the key parts to this. So the key part to a plain chi-squared test, not chi-squared goodness of fit, is that you have two or more groups of the same variable, and that this is a generalization of two proportion z test. Okay? Now, this chi squared test is sometimes called chi squared test of homogeneity. Homogeneity, that's that, how you say that. And it's also sometimes called chi squared test of independence. Alright, now that's two different names for the same test. So it's computed the same. The conclusions are the same. The only difference is the way the question is worded. Okay, so these two things, the homogeneity and independence tests, are calculated the same. They are concluded in the same way. All right, and then um, the only difference <coughs> is the way that the question is worded. Okay, so let's talk about that. Homogeneity would mean that things are happening homogeneously. <laughs> and what does that word homogeneous imply? Good. Homogeneous implies same. So if you have a question as to if things are happening at the same rate, then that would be the homogeneity aspect of the question. Okay? I want to know if um, the proportion of the Skittles, or no, let's do the uh, peanut butter M&Ms, and the proportion of regular M&Ms are happening at the same rate, okay? So now I'm comparing the browns together and the reds together and all of those together. So see, we could take our data from Monday with some of you having peanut butter M&Ms and some of you having the regular M&Ms, and we could 
do all of the comparisons of the peanut butter M&Ms to the regular M&Ms to see if the colors are happening at the same rate. Okay? Now, <coughs> the way independence would be worded, here's the way the question would be worded. <coughs> well, typically when we think about independence, we're wondering if two things are what? Related. Related. Very good. Are they connected? Are they related? Do they affect each other? Okay, so we were wondering if the items are related. Okay, so let's think about our M&Ms from Monday. The homogeneity question would be, are the colors of M&Ms in regular M&Ms happening at the same rate as the color of M&Ms in the peanut butter packs of M&Ms? That would be the homogeneity question. The independence question would be, are the proportion of colors in peanut butter M&Ms related to the, or let's see here, no, that's wrong, sorry. Are the proportion of colors related to the type of M&Ms? Are the proportion of colors related to the type of M&Ms? Meaning, because it's regular or because it's peanut butter, is that changing the proportion of the colors? Okay. All right. The bottom line is, these two are run the same way. They might just phrase the question differently. All right. Now, let's talk about our assumptions and conditions. We, we don't mark this down, but we just make sure we are dealing with proportions of data, actual counts of data, not percentages and not means. Because <clears throat> remember, chi squared is not one proportion, it's not two proportions. Chi squared is what? Multiple proportions. Okay. And this chi squared is multiple two proportions. All right, we still want to do the random. Now, the text says we don't need this as long as we're not generalizing. Why would we not tend to generalize? So, in AP, we always hope that, that's our, that we can do that. So, we always need to check the randomness that the things were pulled randomly. <coughs> All right. We also would want to say independent condition. Now, if I can't say that, you know, I can say things like, the female group is independent of the male group. There's no overlapping people in the groups. The peanut, uh, peanut butter M&Ms are independent of the regular M&Ms because do I have any crossovers of the groups? No. <clears throat> so there's different ways that I can do that. And then, of course, our expected values are still at least 5 for chi squares. Okay. The last little factual that's item that's different from the past is degrees of freedom. <coughs> How are degrees of freedom for our goodness of fit? Good. Good. Okay. So for chi squared goodness of fit, the degrees of freedom were the categories minus one. Well, here I have multiple categories, so I have to account for that. So what I have is rows minus 1 times the categories, which would be listed in the columns minus 1. They might be switched, but rows minus 1 because I'll have multiple rows and multiple columns of data. All right, so I have more columns of data and more rows of data. All right, with that being said, I actually want to just jump into doing a problem and let you see how it falls out almost identical to the kind of problems we've done in the past with a few little tweaks, a new calculator uh, way to compute. So if you do not have your calculator, make sure you go and get that. And right now, let's turn to this problem here. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about what this problem is about. It's common folk wisdom that drinking cranberry juice can help prevent urinary tract infections in women. And so this is an actual study in the 2001 British Medical Journal report that was, and these are the results from the Finnish study in which three groups of 50 women 
were monitored for these infections over six months. One group drank cranberry juice daily. Another group drank a lactobacillus drink. So that lactobacillus, you know, that's like your cult or some, you know, like activia type. They drink, they ate the yogurt or whatever. Something that's trying to regular, yeah, regulate the biotic content in your in your system, your intestine system. Okay. Now the third group drank neither of those beverages and served as the control group. In the control group, so now we say over the course of six months, the proportion of the group that experienced at least one urinary tract infection, 18 women in the control group um, developed at least one infection, 20 in the lactobacillus group, and then eight of those in the cranberry juice group. Does this study provide supporting evidence for the value of cranberry juice in warding off urinary tract infections? So, before we start diving into the data, let's talk about the design. Is this a survey, a retrospective survey, a prospective study, retrospective study, prospective study, or an experiment, and why? Why experiment? Very good. Okay, so put that down. We've got an experiment because we imposed treatment upon groups. do not say anything about selecting this people randomly. We don't know if they volunteered. We also don't know if they randomly assigned them to those three different groups. Um, that's a little more detailed, you know, in the design we have to review later because it has to do with who you can generalize the things to, the data to. But here we go. <clears throat> Will you test a goodness of fit, a homogeneity, or independence? We have but keep in mind of the design first before you answer that. I have a cranberry juice group, a lactobacillus group, and a control group, and I'm interested in the proportion infected, and I need to include not infected so I account for the total amount of the group. So with these multiple have three, two proportions that I'm comparing, or I could, you know, do this multiple proportion comparison. What am I dealing with? Am I dealing with goodness of fit? No. no. Okay, so I know it's not that. Um, okay, so homogeneity versus independence would have to do with how I want to word the question. Isn't that homogeneity? Because you want to see if they're the same. That's beautiful. Technically, I could probably word it either way. But I think most naturally it falls under this category of homogeneity because I'm interested initially in if cranberry juice, lactobacillus, and the control group are having a urinary tract infection at the same rate. So that same rate idea is making me go homogeneity. Well, goodness, of fit. <laughs> um, goodness of fit would be just like, I'd probably have to have some different infections like a urinary tract infection, a kidney infection, all those kinds of things, and then I would just have the one cranberry group. So I'd have one cranberry group over different kind of infections, and I would see if it's helping it, helping any of the different kinds of infections more than any others. Uh, or at a different rate, is it helping the infection at a different rate? Okay, so let's state our hypotheses. So our null hypothesis, I don't really have room down here, so I'm gonna go up above here. How would I phrase that null hypothesis? I'm going to see if the sort of you're on the right track. All the juices are the same. Okay. Well, what do you mean? The, the amount juices. of infections while drinking all of it. Okay. Now he says the amount of infections. Amount of now there's that quantitative. Number. 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 Okay. Proportion of people infected or rate of people infected? Yes, because it has to be proportionate, not quantitative. Okay, good. So, I want to see if the rate of infection, well, actually, the null is that the rate of a UTI, I'll just call it a UTI, urinary tract infection for the three groups, yeah, is the
the sink. Okay, very good. So I'm saying that I have to start off with that the cranberry juice and lactobacillus and control group are all happening at the same rate. The alternative is going to be that the rate of infection, rate of urinary tract infection is for the three groups. the same or I could say different so they're not the same okay very good all right no biggie same ideas all as we've been doing all semester test the conditions so random you know they never said they were selected or assigned randomly so then we're going to have to assume independent how can I get an independent concept going here. Perfect. Very good. The group members are independent of each other. Do we have to assume it for all three groups or is it do this all go into the point? Yeah, this will, I'm wording this as if it's all group members. So I guess I should say all group members because if somebody's in the cranberry juice group, they are not in either of the other groups. And likewise. Oh. Girlfriends, good job. Okay, I guess I do need to say that. Assumed for um, all three. So I guess that needs to be a stamp. Woo! Here I come, fifth period, and now just someone saying that, what happened all day long? Okay, good job. Wow, that is too crowded, and I need more room, but sorry about that this year. Okay, large enough. Large enough is going to have to be that all of the expected counts are greater than or equal to five. So, all expected are greater than or equal to five, and I'm going to point to the picture of my table of expected, which I'm going to show you how to get that in a second. Do not just say, you know what? All the expected are greater than five. Don't you see? I looked at it in my calculator, and I can see that they are all greater than five, right? Wink, wink. No. Prove it by writing it out. Okay? You don't write it out. You haven't proven anything. Now, let's talk about how to do this. So let's get to the conversation. <coughs> Fill up your calculator. And because we have multiple rows and multiple columns, we cannot do the um, lists. Okay? Because these are in um, multiple more than one variable. So we have to do it in the matrix. All right? You know, in algebra 2, you would do these problems in the matrix when you would have more than one variable, x's and y's, or x's and y's and z's. Okay? I would do that with my guys, and you would do that. Y'all kind of ended up probably doing them more by hand, but you could do them in the matrix. All right. So where is the matrix in your calculator? Second, x to the negative 1. Okay. All right. Now, I happen to have something in mine already. You may not. We are going to edit and put information into matrix A. So go over to edit just like you do when you edit a list. And hit enter. All right. You're going to have to play with these numbers. It's two by three because it's rows by columns. Two rows of data, infected and non-infected, and three columns of data. So it's two by three. And then put in the, the values in the observed. So your matrix A is all the observed data. Okay, so let me give you a second to put those things in. The columns are not variables, the rows are... Like that, or? At least 42, 32. Categories, I guess. The variables. Oh. And the categories. Categories are rows. And if you look at the next example, that will make it clear. It's men, men and women. Those are our variables. And the 
categories are the rank of their um, in NYPD. Officer, detective, da 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 da. Okay, so once you have that in, then we're going to do our chi squared test. So where do we calculate tests? Okay, so we're going to go to stat, over to tests. I go up to get to it faster. Make sure you do not do chi-squared goodness a bit. You are doing the full-blown chi-squared test because we have multiple variables. Um, and observe is matrix A. And guess what? The calculator will do the matrix B, which is it'll paste into matrix B the expected values. And so we're going to let it do that right now. I will tell you that tomorrow, because we're just getting a general idea today, Tomorrow, I will go into the specifics of how you get those expected values, but you need to know that. But for right now, we're just going to go with the general idea, let the calculator give it to us, and there is our chi-squared and our p-value that we're very well aware of. And we'll talk about degrees of freedom in a second. Wait, how do you put in the A and the B? Because I might have to choose these. Uh, so okay. Alright, so let's um, actually fill in these expected. Okay, that's what we are looking for. So here's how you view the expected. Where is the expected about? Where are the expected values at? In matrix B. So let's view matrix B. The way you can view matrix B is go second matrix. And you can actually just go down to matrix B and hit enter. It's kind of annoying because it shows up really big and you can't see everything. If you go as if you were going to edit it, edit matrix B, you will get a better view. You'll get that view very nice. If you did not go into edit mode, let me go ahead and show you what that would have looked like. It's a little annoying. Here's matrix B, what it looks like. Will you show it one more time? Uh, yes, hold on just a second. Huh. Wow. Ah, I don't know. Let me quit this. Okay. And now let me try and view matrix B from this version. Okay. See, it just pulls up matrix B, and if I hit enter, Look at how annoying this picture is. Then you have to like right arrow over to see the next values. Okay. Yeah, I don't like that view. To me, it's a little confusing. You can't tell where you are in the list. So again, going into the edit mode, over to edit, down to matrix B, hit enter, and that's clearer. Okay? All right. I want to tell you what the, just briefly where those numbers come from, and we're going to get a depth into that tomorrow. Since these all have 50 in their group, then they all should have the same number of infected if they're happening at the same rate, because all of these groups are the size 50. So they just took the 8, 20, and 18 and averaged that, and that's how you would expect there to be 15.3 in each of the groups, which leaves this many not in the groups, not infected. Okay, let's go to the next question. How many degrees of freedom? What's our new way of computing degrees of freedom? Rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. So, how many rows does this problem have? There's two. There's two, so 2 minus 1. How many columns does this problem have? Three. Three columns. So that's 1 times 2, so that's why the calculator showed that the degrees of freedom are 2. You cannot just count on the calculator giving that to you. Again, we have to know what the calculator is doing to get that. Um, we did calculate the chi-squared value to be 7.776, and the p-value was 0.0205.
think, or four. So same idea as our same conclusions. I can say that this 0 0.0205 is what? Less than, Less than alpha, which is 0 0.05. Therefore, my decision is to reject the, null. reject the null. Very good. Make sure you put reject the, you know, null. I get people that just say reject. Well, what are you rejecting? Are you rejecting me? Are you rejecting the null? Are you rejecting the color of your hair? Are you rejecting the alternative? I mean, what are you rejecting? Okay. And so then what do we have evidence to can conclude? We, can we say that cranberry is more? Or no, nope, we cannot safe? say cranberry is more. All we can say is that the alternative is true. And what does our alternative say? The rates are, the rates are not the same. Do I know anything about specifically cranberry juice yet? No. I do know it's not the same. But I don't know, like, if it's better. So I, I have to start there. If it was the same, then I could stop. If they were the same, if they were happening at the same rate, then I could say, is cranberry juice better? Okay, let me say that again. Okay. Bueller, Bueller, cricket, cricket, cricket. Okay. Okay, so here it is again. Ready? If all of the infections were happening at the same rate, then... Would I say cranberry juice is better? No. Good. So that's our starting point. Okay, so, so I conclude there is evidence to suggest that the three groups do not have urinary tract infections at the same rate. Okay, so that's a big first step. Yes, ma'am. Nothing. I just say them both. That's okay, either way. It's different words. It's all right. Um, okay, I think suggest is probably a little more wiggly, but uh, either is fine. Okay, so we still need to, we still can go further now. We need to now see if, now that they're all different, how different are they? And here's where that comes from. All right, you ready? Way back, way back, last semester, we had stuff like this. Line of best fits and actual points and scatter plots and residuals. What's residual? The average distance away from the. Oh, good. Uh, okay, that's actually, yeah. Not the average, actually, a residual is specifically. Uh, the distance away from the expected. Expected, perfect. Yeah. The actual, how far the actual is away. Remember AP, actual minus predicted. Here, the actual is less than predicted, so I would have a negative residual. All right? Now, observed, you, I need you to make this connection. That observed and expected are identical synonymous words. Do you, does that make logical sense, that actual and observed are identical. What actually happens is what you observed, right? And what was predicted was what you expected to happen. Okay, so you do need to be aware that these words could be interchanged. All right. Now, to get a standardized residual, standardized residuals, we need to, we don't just go observed minus expected. We do observed minus expected, but we want to do it in terms of expected. Now, I'm going to throw this up here for a second and then tell you how to remember this. It's over the square root of expected. All right, so this is how you get the standardized residuals. You do the observed minus the expected over the square root of expected. And here's how you can remember that. Here's good old formula chart. 
ta-da, back of the formula chart. <coughs> Remember earlier this week, we discovered this lovely chi squared, our last item of the, of the page. If you think about taking the square root of both of those, or basically not squaring it, it's just a chi. It's not a chi squared. We just want a chi because we want to know the direction. We don't want to square it because when we square it, we get rid of the direction. So I want it to be unsquared. I want it to be a straight up just observed minus expected. And so then that means I have to do the square root at the bottom. Okay, so let's do that for this. So here we go. Um, I am going to take away these numbers here and we're going to compute all of these standardized residuals. I'm gonna do one with you and then you'll do the rest. Let's do, let's find the standardized residual for cranberry juice people that are infected. Okay, so here we go. What is the observed cranberry juice infections? One. Good, observed cranberry juice infections is eight. That's the observed. What's the expected? Correct, 15.3. This is the, uh, the expected cranberry juice. See, expected and observed. All right, so let's fill these in. So, 8 is observed, 15.3 is expected over the square root of 15.3. So that standardizes it. That value is negative 1.87. So I can see that the residual, the standardized residual right here is negative 1.87. So cranberry juice is getting an infected rate at what than expected? Less than expected because the standardized residual is negative. All right. I want you now to calculate the rest of the ones that go in there and see then we'll make a conclusion. Okay, so here are your results. These are your standardized residuals. Now we can make a specific conclusion. Now we can say something more than they are happening at a different rate. Now I can say something specifically about cranberry juice. So what do you want to say about cranberry juice? Cranberry juice group got what? Infection at a lower rate. Less than expected. And yes, less than everybody else because they got more, they got an infection more than expected. Cranberry juice was the only group that got an infection less than expected. So let's do a proper conclusion. Here it is. You don't even have to get the residuals. The standardized ones. You can, but the proper way to like, quote unquote, give official evidence is a standardized residual. Okay. All right, so according to my standardized residuals. Okay, do you hear me? Zach actually had a good point. He said, well, you could just see that from the data, that it's the only one that's less. But to be official, I want them in terms of standardized residuals. According to, and state that, according to the standardized residuals, cranberry juice group, cranberry juice group is the only group with less than expected Proportion of infections or infection rate. Proportion of urinary tract infections. Okay, very good. Now, so that's the official. So this standardized residuals allows us to be more specific. We could say more than just the group. The groups are not happening at the same rate. We could specifically talk about cranberry juice. Okay. Now, next problem, I'm going to go ahead and um, 
fill you in on some things to expedite all of the number crunching. So, um, I actually, let's start with this problem and then I want to kind of show you where these expected numbers come from. All right, so here we go. This is a table of the data from the New York City Police Department. Okay, and so what we're wondering if this data indicates that men and women are equitably represented at all levels of the department. Okay, so, so it's clear that you can see there's a lot different numbers between males and females. Okay, so I basically have two groups, the males and the females, and then I have, so my variables are gender and race. There. Okay, sure. So my genders are gender, I'm sorry, my variables are gender. So I'm comparing gender to race. So those are my two variables. Two variables, gender and race. And my categories are these different ones in each of the things, okay? All right, so let's talk about this. How can I, how can I see the relationship, you know, like if this number is way weird than this number? Because overall, there's a lot less females in the police department. Good. We need to know, first of all, first and foremost, what proportion of the police department is what? Female. Sure, let's pick female. That's actually what A asked. What proportion of the police department is female? Well, let me get you some numbers here. Since there are 56, 13 females, and the total of the force is 37,300. So if you added all these numbers, you get 37,379. How do I get this proportion? 5613 over 37379. And so it's about 15%. So 15% of the force is females. All right. Now we have somewhere to go from there. So if the males and the females are equitably placed in the police force, I should have 15% female officers, 15% of the officers are detectives, 15% of the, sorry, 15% of the sergeants are female, 15% of the lieutenants are female, 15% of the captains are female, and 15% of the higher ranks are female. So they are 15% of the force. So they should be 15% of every position. Let's see if they are. Um, C actually, let's skip B, it kind of doesn't play into the problem. Assuming no bias in promotion, how many female detectives do you expect? Well, how many total detectives are there? There's 4864 total detectives. So what proportion of them should be females? 15%. Okay. So since there's 480, or 4,864 detectives, and 15% of them should be females, that number comes out to about 730. In fact, it's this number right here. That's what is expected, okay? 15% of the detectives should be female. Okay, well, let's do the officers. How do I figure out the officers? <coughs> It is from the calculator doing the proportion of detectives. I think that's a rounding thing. Is it really 13%? Yeah. Okay. I'll look at it here in a second. How would 13% be more? 
Okay, so no, something else going on. All right, back to this. How many officers are on the force? 26,181. How many of those should be females? What percent of the officers should be females? Hello? How many percent of this should be females? 15%, yay. So what's 15% of 26? Guess what? 15% is 3,000. That's 15% of 26,181. Guess what this number is? 15% of what? The total sergeants. The total sergeants is 4313. Okay? What is this number? What's expected? 15% of what? 1422. This number is 371 and 228. So all of these numbers here are 15% of these totals because the females are 15% of the force, so they should be 15% of each rank. All right, with that being said, let's compare. 3931 is what's expected for females. How many actually are officers? More. So, let's do detectives. 730 is 15%, but how many are actually females? More. So there are more females than expected in the officer and detective. What about the others? There's less. In fact, let's get down. I did the standardized residuals. Look here. Females are overrepresented in the officer and detective groups, and females are what? Underrepresented in all the rest. Furthermore, I could even say this. They are most grossly underrepresented in which position? Captain. Okay, so do you see how this standardized residuals allows you to go even further? Would you expect that I would get a, a pi squared number and a p-value and it would allow you to reject or fail to reject? What's your null? That male and female are um, having equally represented. So the alternative is that they are not equally represented. What does this imply? They are not equally represented. So I would anticipate doing what to the null? Rejecting it. Good. Okay. Is there anything like the chi squared, uh huh. Do like inverse chi squared to get like a pi? Um, I don't think so. I think you have. I don't think we have that on our calculator. You have to go to the table, or it calculates it, like the chi squared table, which I think you missed. Oh, yeah, you missed. Okay. So, there you go. We didn't go through this entire problem, but I wanted to summarize kind of some of these results. Hopefully, you can kind of visualize going through this. Now, homework-wise, there are five problems, but I just want you to do two. I want you to do number 11 on the homework and number 13 on the homework because they are as thorough as what we've just done. Furthermore, you are, where are you in your uh, thing? Packet 60 to 70. 60 to 70 right now. Tonight. Yeah. Tonight is 60 to 70, yes. 